orange is a strategy for us around here. It's a big deal. It's a strategy because it, you get orange by mixing two things, two colors, right? You got yellow and red. And the idea, our strategy here at the church in, in leading uh, young people to an active faith in Jesus Christ is that it takes the yellow light of Christ in the church and the red warmth of the family coming together to make sure that those next generations of young people are led to an act of faith in Jesus Christ. It is important that we work together, that we are better together. That's the idea of orange. Families can't do it. You cannot do it by yourself in raising kids who are connected to their faith long term. The church can't do it by itself, raising kids that are connected. Uh, they, they can't do it. Together, we can do it. Now, last week, we looked at family values. What are some of the family values that we need? And that, that, the red part, the, the warm heart of the family. If you missed that, check that out online because there's some important ideas there that you can live out. And then today we're going to look at church values and uh, how important those church values are in next generation faith. So before we move on and, and move into that, though, I want to encourage you to do two things. I do this every week, right? Take some notes. If there's something that, that hits you, like, yeah, I need to know that. I need to remember that. I maybe need to be prepared to share that. Write some things down. Second thing is use the study guide. Yeah, there are paper copies out in the lobby. It's available online. The main goal, though, of the study guide is that we, as a people who call this our church home, we're in the Scriptures. We're opening the Bible. We're looking at how God, listening for God, and how God might uh, shape us to be the people that we have the potential to be. So, here we are, um, finishing out this series. Now, there's a man named Reggie Joyner, who is one of the co-founders of the Think Orange movement, and I heard him speak a little while back, and I'm like, oh my gosh, on church values, I think he nailed it. It grabbed my attention immediately, and that's what I want to share with you today, is, is really how he articulated church values in a way that maybe will make sense to all of us together in this idea of orange. Um, these are values that um, I'm going to kind of list out here for you today, and I got these big books up here. Don't worry, I'm not going to open them up and read from them to you. They're books that convey single but powerful concepts that we hope our kids own. Truths, if you will. Truths that we want our children, our young people to own. And here is one of the first truths. No. That we want our young people to know that they can know God, that God's not hiding that God can be known and God reveals Himself in lots of different ways, that God can be known. And that is an important thing. Uh, and we try to articulate how God can be known in so many different ways. But, but that is an important concept. And then we also want this truth for our kids to embrace, that they can become followers of Jesus in a moment, just like that. What is that moment? Well, it's when it's when anybody, a young person or an old person, when, when, when anyone realizes that Jesus is God in human form, who He walked this earth, He lived, He taught, He died, He was resurrected from the dead to show us that death does not win, that life wins. And, and once we accept that, in that moment, in that moment we are born again. In that moment we become a new creation. We want kids to know that that moment is important. And then there's this, the Bible. We want kids to know. We talk about the Bible all the time. We encourage you to read it every day, right? We want, we want our children, our young people to know that the Bible is our first authority, that it is our, our, our revelation of Jesus, that it contains everything necessary for salvation. And then, this is another important value, trust. We want our young people to know that they can trust God and that trust, the act of trust, deepens our faith. And what we try to teach our young people, and I try to teach everybody, adults, is that, that trust can begin with the little things, or it can begin with the big things, but when we trust God, our faith grows. Trust and faith are, are yoked and linked together in very, very powerful ways. And then, there's this, the church. One of the truths we want them to embrace is that the church is important. It's the living body of Jesus, Right? We want, we want our young people to embrace the church and love the church and know that things can happen in community, a faith community, that can't happen when we're out there just by ourselves. And then, beliefs. Beliefs matter. Beliefs absolutely matter. Because, listen, beliefs shape what? Behavior. Beliefs shape behavior behavior. We want our kids to have that Christian framework, that follower mindset of following Jesus that shapes their belief, knowing that a, a Christ-centered belief system shapes the entire outcome of someone's life. And then 
ideal. We try to convey the, the, the understanding that God has an ideal of what life can be like in, in, in our relation, relational world, whether that's friendships or dating world or marriage. Uh, uh, God has an ideal of how we handle our, our time and our finances. God has ideals for these things, and, and us embracing those ideals also shapes our lives. And then one of the biggest truths of all is that God is good. God's love is unconditional. That God seeks us out and God cares about us as people. God cares about our entire world. Now, these aren't all the truths that we want to convey to our young people, but this is a, these are some of the top ones. These are some of the, the most important ones. But here is the twist. I'll put this up on the screen. Just because something is true doesn't mean someone will hold on to it. You know what I'm talking about? Just because something can be absolutely true does not mean that someone is going to hold on to it. So, um, there's a, a friend of mine. We grew up together almost our whole lives. We had a calling to ministry together at the same time. God, we felt God calling us. And, and at the same time, we were taught about how God is good. And, and then, you know, that was in high school, then college came, and we went different directions. And somewhere in college or during his career, he began to ask the question, well, if God is so good, why don't the people that call on God's name start doing good things in this world? It doesn't seem like they're doing a lot. They're maybe calling God good, but they're not doing anything good. And he's like, that, that can't be if that's who God is. He, he left the church, left the faith. And then uh, this ideal thing. Another friend of mine who uh, really tried to live out the ideals of a of a following life, a life of following Jesus in his marriage, as a, as a dad, in his career, in his just everything. He tried to follow those ideals and it all came crumbling down. Ended up in divorce. Ended up losing everything. He was like, if, if those are the ideals, I'm out. He's gone. Um, then there's beliefs. I don't know how many people have forwarded me pictures. This is painful stuff. Forwarded me pictures of Christians holding signs at churches. In fact, they were in front of our church a number of years ago. Holding signs in front of churches um, at the funerals of military people. Holding signs on college campuses that says, God hates fags. So many people hear that and see that and think that is, if that's what Christians believe, that is so much based in hate. Even the signs themselves say it. Hate. I'm out. Then there's the church. And, you know, there, there are tons of people, tons of people right now who say, I'm, I'm in with God. You know, I like God. I like Jesus. He was, he's my kind of rebel, you know. But church, who needs it? I don't need church to be a follower, so they're not here. And then trust. You know, way too many young people, they start asking deep questions in middle school and in high school, and in so many Christian circles out there in our world, they're told, oh, oh don't ask those questions, just trust. But what about, no, 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 no what about, just trust. And if they can't ask their questions, they're out. And then there's the Bible, our first authority, that contains everything that, that we need for salvation. And if you've been around here a while, you've probably heard, you, you probably heard me tell the story of my grandfather, who he was raised in the faith, and, and then he, he was a man of science. He was uh, an author and an artist, and he was told, this would have been in the in the 20s and 30s, he was told that um, science is a liar. That's what he was told. Science was a liar and that he had to believe that the earth was created in exactly seven days and that the earth is about 10,000 years old. And he said that he was told if he couldn't believe all that, then he was out. So he was out. And then the moment. There are so many young people in particular who have that moment. And, and old people too, right? Who have a moment where... And it is a real moment where they experience the power and presence of God, and it is so real, it's overwhelming. 
But then they realize, wait a second, my, I still have, have my temptations. I still have my struggles. I still have these weaknesses. What good did that moment do me? And pretty soon, a moment's not enough. And then uh, there's a businessman I know who uh, is really good at, at systems and really good at managing, and so his church invited him to be on their governing board. And then he saw how the sausages are made. He saw how in his church governing board there were these, this group over here who believed one thing and this group over here who believed another thing and how they called each other names and how one was sure that they knew what God wanted. Another group was sure they knew what God wanted and all they did was fight. And he said, if that's what knowing means, I'm out. Remember that thing I put up on the screen a little bit ago? Just because something is true doesn't mean people will hold on to it. I'm going to give you some sobering information. This comes from a, a Barna research study. In 2012, 17% of 18 to 30-year-olds said that they doubted the existence of God. So that was 2012. In 2017, 32% of 18 to 30-year-olds said they doubted the existence of God. It's a pretty amazing jump. Same study found this. Eight out of ten believe going to church is not important. Sixty-five percent say they are not religious. When asked, um, a vast majority of those young people said at one point they believed. At one point they were connected. But the church and family failed to help that belief stick. Why? Well, most of the time, the attempt to get it to stick was done through guilt, fear, um, duty and obligation. Does that work with anybody? Well, some, but not many. See, because of the nature of our time and how knowledge and culture have changed, because of the nature of information and the information age that we're in now, it is a different time. And if we use the same techniques that worked 10 years ago to lead kids to an act of faith in Jesus that sticks, or 20 years ago, or 50 years ago, all we end up doing is, is trying to convince, convince young people that there is this big God, but we present Him in this very tiny way. So, i got a rubber band up here. i got a rubber band here. And um, if, if I were to invite Pastor Ben, where is he? Yeah, he's not here. He ran away. If I were to invite him up here and I were to wad up this, this rubber band and throw it at his arm, what would happen? Not much. Yeah, bounce right off. But if I invited Pastor Ben up here, which I really, really want to do, and I got his arm up close, and I did this, uh, it'd be a different story, right? Why? Because when there's tension here, there is energy, and there's power. Without tension, there's nothing. Here's why this is important when it comes to truth and what we're trying to convey as a church. Most of the time, Christians hate tension especially when it comes to our truth. But when we try to eliminate the tension, then we also eliminate the power that our truth, that we're called to convey, that we're called to share, the power of that truth is also diminished. We're called to keep some truths in tension. When we take away the tension around our truth, we lose its power. See, I think God wants to understand as much as our small brains can, just how big He really is. And, you know, we, we often think that, that the tension of truth um, waters down the, the gospel. Or we may think that the tension... Um, well, here's what I'm getting at. Things like, like the mercy of God and the, and the justice of God. There's a tension between those two things. The mercy and justice of God. But the mercy of God doesn't water down the justice of God. It actually, it actually amplifies it. The works we're called to do in Scripture don't water down the grace of Scripture. It amplifies it. But those two have to live in tension. There are many concepts like that. They have to live in tension. Here, here's my point. I'll put this on the screen. Tension doesn't make truth less true. It makes it more real. I'm going to illustrate this for you. Here's what I mean. I'm, 
Uh, if you really want to stretch kids' faith, if you really want to capture their hearts and imaginations long term, you've got to look at truth in a different way. I wasn't taught this when I was growing up. This is something that it t- took me the last 10 years really to embrace and to figure out. This is not how I was taught, but this is how we are teaching young people today that yes, you can know God. And yes, God is a mystery that you will not figure out. Wait, are both of those true? Absolutely. Do you like that tension? Probably not. Here's the thing, here's why this is important. Because as parents, teachers, volunteers here at church, you know, there's a point at which, yeah, kids, kids look up to us and think, oh my gosh, these adults know everything. And then there's a point when they think, wait a second. There's a whole bunch of stuff they don't know anything about. And if we try to contain God in one little box, their faith will not stick. So here's another truth tension. Yes, people can become a follower of Jesus in a moment. When you embrace the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, you are a new creation, but it will take you forever to figure out what that means. Yeah, this is important stuff. And and our Wesleyan roots actually get this. You know, uh, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, he articulated this well. That moment is called the the justification by grace. Happens in a moment. And then he talked about this. These are big words. Sanctification by grace is the other part. Justification, sanctification. It takes a lifetime to become sanctified, to become holy, to know what that means. It takes a lifetime to become what God has called you to become. And this is important because if all we talk about is the moment and people are suddenly like, well, wait, I'm no different. I've still got these sin struggles. I've still got these issues. I still have these temptations. If that's all that they have, they're going to be out. We need to teach that it's messier and more complicated. And then, then there's this. Of course, we believe the Bible is our first authority. It has everything necessary for salvation. But we also believe that life has much to teach us as well. Yes, the Bible is our guide to theology. Yes, our Bible is the window to our understanding of God and our understanding of Jesus. But not everything about life is addressed in here. Which is why alongside the Bible, in our tradition as a as, as Wesleyans, again, it's, it's alongside the Bible, not in place of, not of equal value, but alongside our tradition, experience, and reason to help us understand. You see, that old phrase, the Bible said it, I believe it, and that settles it, that old phrase is driving more people away from God than it is drawing people to God. And if we tell kids, well, this is all there is, that's all you need, it will not be enough to allow their faith to stick. And I think Scripture tells us this too. Look at Romans real quick. This is a passage that Paul wrote. He said, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from... Say these next words with me. Say it with me. Ready? What has been made. Do you know what I think that means? I think it means that God is saying there's a lot out there in this world that you need to research and discover and see there are things out there that will build your faith. See, God set it up for us to learn from all kinds of things out there in life and all kinds of people. Can we learn things from people who are not Christians? Absolutely. Why? How? Because they're people that God has made. That's why. This is important stuff. Um, and by the way, I should say this. You know, there's truth that is non-biblical. And we've got to be careful here. There's stuff out there that's anti-biblical. We, we, don't, you know, we don't embrace that. But there's truth that is non-biblical that we're called to live out. God is bigger than our Bibles. Okay, so, how about this one? Trust, yes, trust grows your faith. 
so does doubt. Doubt grows your faith. I've talked about this as what I talked about at Easter this year, right? Doubt is not the opposite of faith. Doubt, the Latin is dubitare. It means to pause, to hesitate. It's that space that allows us to ask questions and to get answers. And here's what I have learned recently, that our kids are learning much earlier than I learned, is that if I pretend like I don't have any doubts, then pretty soon I'm pretending that I have faith. Did you hear that? If I pretend I don't have any doubts, then pretty soon I'm pretending that I have faith. We'll put this on the screen. If you don't let kids process their own doubt, they will never own their own faith. And isn't that what we want? That's the end goal. We want them to own their own faith. So don't get worried if your kids, right about middle school, high school, maybe earlier, maybe later, if they start asking questions, you need to get worried if they don't start asking questions because that means they don't feel safe enough to express their doubts and ask their questions. Yes, we want our young people to love the church. And we also want our young people to love the world. It's not one or the other. And by world, I don't mean the darkness of the world. I don't mean the evil of the world. I don't mean the oppression of the world. I'm talking about the world of people and the world of culture and the world of art and the world of music and the world of nature. We've created a false dichotomy between these two, but they need to live in tension. We want kids to love both. And the reason this is important is because your kids are going to start enjoying things that are not spiritual, quote, end quote. That's okay. Our job as a church, one of our values is to teach them that everything is spiritual. There is nothing that God's Spirit doesn't touch. There's nothing you could look at that God's Spirit is not within, but we've got to teach that. It's okay to have friends that are not Christians. Don't get worried if you like to listen to the Eagles, okay? Don't get worried if you like to listen to Justin Timberlake. Ladies, give a holla. Now, worry, I, I worry about you if you listen to Justin Bieber, but <laughs> kids need to okay, need to know that it's okay to love their church and love living in this world. Um, God is bigger than this church, by the way. Here's another tension our kids need to know. Beliefs matter. It is a truth. Beliefs matter because beliefs shape behavior. It's got to be held in tension with this. Beliefs matter, but people matter more. All you got to do is look at Jesus. That's all you got to do. How he treated people. He got most frustrated. Who did Jesus get most frustrated with? The religious leaders, the Pharisees, who said, it's all about right belief. And Jesus said, I don't care what you believe. I'm going to heal sick people on the Sabbath. (gasps) Can't be done. The belief said, oh, those lepers, they're lepers for a reason. God doesn't like them. They're lepers because they're sinners. Jesus says they may be lepers, but they are loved. If your beliefs make you hurt people, then your beliefs are wrong. That's the tension we live in. Oh man, it's hard, isn't it? Isn't it hard? Nobody said this would be easy. Hmm. How about this? Yes, there is an ideal. God has given us an ideal, what it looks like to live, to love, to be in a relationship. There are ideals that we are called to live up to, but at the same time, this truth shouts out, God uses broken people still. Why is this important? Because these ideals that we're conveying to our young people, they're going to fail at them at some point. Some of them drastically. And that's when we open up our scriptures and we say, look at all these people, their stories in the Bible, people that messed up so bad and yet God loved them and used them to accomplish His work. See, listen, when your kids feel like they can't measure up, they may give up. 
We have to live in the tension here. To live in the tension. You know what we call the tension in this, this case? Probably a lot of these cases. You know what we call it? Grace. Grace. And then, yes, truth. God is good. And here's the other truth. You are called to do good. We can't just point kids to a a message of good news. We can't just point young people to a message of, of God being good, the gospel message. We also have to connect that message to this truth. You have to do good as God's good creation. Jesus said, let your light so shine out there in the world that others will see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven Paul said, you were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. He said, faith without works is, anybody know? Anybody? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Dead. Here's what John Wesley, again, the founder of the Methodist movement, here's what he said. He said, do all the good you can by all the means you can in all the ways you can in all the places you can at all the times that you can to all the people you can as long as you ever can. I like that. So yeah, we have to point to the truth of a good God, but we also have to point to the truth of you are to do good for that good God. So we've got to teach these tensions. Because if we say no to this, this probably won't stick. If you emphasize this and not that, then your credibility as a parent, as a teacher, as a leader will be undermined. If you reject this, then they will probably reject this. If you discard this and focus only on this, then our kids might think that God is just a really small God. So listen, we got to remember that the world is watching. Got to remember that our kids are listening. And if you want your kids to have the power to bring good news to this world, then they're going to have to live in these tensions. If you want your young people to have the power to bring healing to this world, if you want your young people, our young people, to reach out with good news that changes the world, then we have to live within this tension. Is it comfortable? No. Is it powerful? Absolutely. And families can't do this alone. You understand? Churches cannot do this alone. We are better together. We need each other. The yellow light of Christ. The red warmth of the home. Together we're unstoppable. So this is how I want to end this series. Um, As you can see, I'm wearing my orange wristband. And you all want one, don't you? So here's the the practical challenge. Um, Stepping up to be that yellow light, the, the, the light of Christ to uh, our young people means you taking ownership in this. We've got a booth set up out there in the lobby. It's bright orange. You can't miss it, but it's a place to go. If God's nudging you. If the Holy Spirit's saying, yeah, it's time. You can go, go, step in. And maybe you doing whatever it is you do, maybe that's to say, I am going to make this a daily prayer for, for my church and my world. Or maybe it's, I can't do, you know, I can't volunteer, I can't step up and, and, and do that, but I can give financially to make sure this happens. Or maybe it is your time. You can say, yeah, I want to work with pre-K. Or I want to work with elementary or middle schoolers or, or high schoolers or college age. Hit the booth, the orange booth, and, and say, here's what I want to do. Or, here, or, or what, do you, what do you need to do? Pick up a wristband, not just to wear it around, but to say, I'm partnering a minute, a minute to win it. Together, we can prepare ourselves, prepare our next generation to encounter and share the life 
giving, light bearing, peace generating, hope overflowing, power and presence of Jesus. Together. And for today, that's the good news. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Just, just ask God to talk to you for a second. Just, just listen. Lord Jesus, King of all kings, Lord of all lords, give us what we need to take the next step in our faith journey, whatever that might be today. And maybe it is today for some of us, maybe it's our moment. Yeah. I don't know, maybe you're sitting here right now. Somebody's sitting here right now, and it's like, I want this. I want to follow this Jesus. Then you just tell him that. Just say, I want to follow you. Just tell him, I turn my back. All that I know is wrong. Just tell him. Say thank you for dying on a cross for me. Tell him. Say please come and be the Lord and leader of my life. Just tell him, please come. Lord, for some of us, it's beyond a moment. It is, it's that forever of becoming active followers of yours. Show us what that means. And give us the courage to take the next step, whatever that might be. Yeah, courage, Lord, we need it. I need it. We pray all this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.